So our next speaker, uh, Dr. Yuman Fong, is the chairman in the Department of Surgery at the City of Hope Medical Center. Dr. Fong is known clinically for his work in the field of liver and pancreatic cancer, especially for his pioneering work on uh, cancer. He runs the Gene Therapy Lab, which is focused on designing genetically modified viruses for the killing of cancer and viral vectors for gene editing. His leadership in the field at the national level has included serving as chair of the Recombinant DNA Advisory Committee and on the NIH. Dr. Fong is co-author of over 750 peer-reviewed articles with only over 65,000 uh, citations. He has served on the editorial boards of 16 journals and is currently editor-in-chief of Molecular Therapy Oncolytics. He is here to tell you how we're going to cure cancer. Human. Thank you very much, uh, Dan, for inviting me, and Dr. Marks, and Dr. Marks, thank you for the honor of uh, addressing the society today, a society that I feel very, very proud of uh, being a member. What I'm going to talk about is innovation, and innovation is nothing new to this society, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about luck, okay? And just like Dan has said, luck is important, but we should all feel very, very lucky. That's because we are alive, we are healthy, we are working in the year 2018 when technology and knowledge is moving so fast that we can actually now capitalize and make progress in a rate that was never seen before. So I'm going to talk a little bit about where I think the field of cancer and minimal invasive surgery is going. I'm going to talk a little bit about philosophy. In fact, mostly about philosophy, so you will have to indulge me. And the, the title of the talk could equally have been Robotic and Gene Surgery, Surgery in the Technology and Genomic Age. And these are my disclosures, but I will talk about nothing that's related to any of those, uh, or uh, products that are related to any of those companies. Well, the challenges are very, very clear, okay? Advances in biology and medicine are moving at such a fast pace, it's hard to keep up. Surgical technology has become very complex. How do we learn it? How do we train it? How do we teach it? It's become very complex. There's tremendous amount of scrutiny about professional practices and performances. So we can't just get up one morning now and uh, go do new things without actually going through entire vetting processes. All of those things that are very, very necessary. And now our electronic communications allows an endless work day. It never stops, okay? But I also see that as an opportunity. These are the challenges, but these are the opportunities because things are moving along so fast, we can make huge progress. Surgical technology in particular is coming along beautifully, and, uh, and I think that in the next 5, 10, 15 years, we're going to be making progress at a rate we've never seen before. There is a tremendous scrutiny of our profession, and, uh, but that is an opportunity to put together things that teach that does credentialing, does everything in a vigorous fashion that makes our field good. And now electric, electronic communications allows us to go spend time with our families, go take vacations and still communicate and make progress, whether it's that night after being on the beach or the next day uh, after having been at, a, 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 at a, a something social, okay? Because of all the major progress in, in, in uh, other fields around us, I'm often asked this, will surgery become obsolete? Since we have so many things now that attack cancer and so many ways of killing cancer, why is surgery even relevant? Okay, and so my answer is that surgery is, re is more relevant than ever, and I'm going to go make some examples based on what I do. I do liver surgery. I do liver surgery. and. I'm going to use it as an example of how we have evolved, how we need to evolve, and how we should evolve. So the disease I treat the most is metastatic colon cancer to the liver because the cancer cells that hit the bloodstream drained by the portal uh, flow to the liver, half the people with colon cancer will eventually show some spots in the liver that are metastatic disease. When I graduated from medical school in 1984, all of those patients were declared incurable, and many of them were sent home to die. That's because we didn't have therapies that were very good, and we did not understand that the liver could be such a good filter that it traps most of the cancer cells, and the cancer cells are mostly killed 
and only a few spots may form. And back then, survival in the mid-1980s was median five to 10 months and nobody lived long term. In fact, a senior member of this society actually once said, hepatic resection for metastases from colorectal cancer is of dubious value. That was just in 1989, not that long ago. Since then, lots of data shown that we can actually resect lesions and provide cure. Uh, here's a paper that I wrote back in 1999 with over 1,000 cases, 42 months median survival, five-year survival in a third of the patients. So even in a short period of time, just from retrospective work, we came to understand that this disease is not hopeless and that surgeons make a huge difference in the outcome. This is a paper that of long-term follow-up of patients that never had chemotherapy. These are, this is actual 25-year follow-up of patients that were operated on by one of my teachers, Joseph Fortner, and even without any chemotherapy, about 20 to 25% of the patients were long-term survivors. No chemotherapy, surgery actually cured people long-term. Then, with some very simple chemotherapies, we're able to bring the five-year and 10-year survival into the 50s and the, and, and the 43% uh, at 10-year. Suddenly, we were curing more and more people. So suddenly, in a single academic lifetime, we went from no one alive in the 70s to about 25% people alive in the, uh, in the 1980s. Now, when somebody walks through the door to see me in the office, I know there's at least a 60% chance I'm going to know them five years later, and there's at least a 40% chance I can cure them. Even patients like this that get downsized uh, by chemotherapy can become potential cures. This is a patient that had over 100 lesions. Chemotherapy got it to this. I resected the rest of the lesions, and this is the patient 14 years later. This is now possible, and this is actually not acknowledged by many of our medical oncology colleagues. Now we're actually operating on more patients than ever. That's because now we're seeing the side effects of the new drugs that are available, like Avastin, where there's perforation, and now we actually need to go do more surgery because patients are living longer, patients are becoming resectable, and patients now have complications that we have never seen before that are necessary to be treated by surgery. So just as this part of the introduction, I just want to say that surgery is live and well. Traditionally in cancer, we think of it as predisposition, pre-malignant, stage one, two, three, and four, and surgeons usually lived at stage one, two, and three for cure, and stage three and four for palliation. But as we do better neoadjuvant and adjuvant therapy, we're now downsizing patients for resectable. Now we're actually working at stage one through four for potential cure and many more patients palliated. And as we understand the genetics and the, and, the, and the predisposition for cancer, we now do better screening. We're now being asked to operate at the predisposition and pre-malignant stage. So more than ever, surgeons are doing more surgery, and now we need to do it better, and now we need to do it in a less invasive fashion. And so the role of surgery, essential part of any curative strategy for solid tumors. I have to remind my medical oncology colleagues that many times every week, okay? Method for obtaining large amounts of tissue for characterization of tumor, side reduction to retard emergence for resistance to systemic treatment. We are doing more and more surgery. Now we should do it better and better. And that's why it should be more cures less invasive, and that's what the society has been about, and that's what the society needs to continue to be about. How do we go deliver this with interrupting patients' lives as little as possible? Now, usually when I go to meetings, I also see it this way, okay? I, in the next five slides, are for some of the young people in the audience, and, uh, and that's because innovation is always thought of as more expensive, more complex. Every now and then, we now need to say, how do we go take a step back? and make therapies affordable by everyone, make therapies less expensive because our technologies have gotten better, and therefore, I show this slide. ORs of the future, when I go to most uh, society meetings, it's usually some large laparoscopic OR with central controls with enhanced communication, so big, fancy, and wired. And as you all know, in your hospitals, building an OR costs between two and five to $10 million per piece, depending on how much technology you put in it. And that's because 
We have fancy light sources and fancy cameras and image processors and many, many displays that are around the room. How can we now take it back a step, okay, and make all of this less expensive? So I challenge some of our industrial partners that are in the room and in the back of the room. How can we not only make more cures, less invasive, but more affordable to everyone? So for example, is it really necessary for a giant light box with a fiber optic cable to bring light to a single source that's expensive cable, then probably that light source and cable and camera costs 75 to $100,000 in your room. And when you go, what about LEDs? They've become really inexpensive. Why shouldn't we just go to LEDs for lighting? Usually, this is the solution. It's a giant box with LEDs in it with a cable that goes to a camera. And so not quite thinking out of the box and just as expensive. So this is a project that my, I was trying to teach my daughter how to solder. So we went and bought a bunch of light, lights from hobby trains. And we made a laparoscopic port out of incandescent lamps on the left and out of LED bulbs that cost two cents a piece on the right. And then we did an operation. Okay, you can see down below on the right hand corner. And these ports can be made very inexpensively and allow us lighting from multiple angles for much less money than what we're talking about in terms of boxes. Why is our camera 70 degrees? With no visibility behind, it's only in one angle. When I can buy a drone, I could fly at 40 miles an hour that transmits 30 frames per second to my cell phone that I could watch on a virtual reality display and lose no frames, okay? Why is the consumer technology that now allows me to buy such a drone for $100 to $1,000 not available to us in the operating room to go and be better cameras and allow us multiple cameras that actually allow us to have stadium views, not ever to look back for where the next instrument's coming and for us to go and do th true 3D mapping inside that's much more robust than anything we have at present. Why shouldn't it be a wide angle, okay? And, uh, uh, and now we can make cameras up to 270 degrees. Why are we still stuck at 70 to 100 to 120 degrees? Why do we have all these displays around the room? Why shouldn't it be something much simpler? Either a see-through display or a VR display and augmented reality. Again, all the technology is now converging. We need to now go and ask for things that make more sense, that are less expensive, so one of the things I'm doing at where I am is that I teach at Caltech and I teach at Harvey Mudd. And at Harvey Mudd, I actually have a team of students that have been working for two years and I've challenged them to make a new MIS OR, multiple lighting, non-corded, inexpensive lighting, multiple cameras, toggle control and multiple images, ergonomic intuitive displays, and I want it for less than $1,000 total that fits in my briefcase so that I can actually take it on the road and operate anywhere in the world. But that also means I'm now teaching the next generation, which is our obligation. We need to teach the next generation of not only surgeons, but engineers to help us come up with things that we need to fulfill the needs that not only we have in this country, but in many nations around the world that are less rich than we are, okay? So robotic surgery. I hang out in that space a lot, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about where liver surgery has gone in that space. When I first started doing laparoscopic surgery, which is the, uh, 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 now seems very, very obvious, okay? But these were all the reasons that I was told, don't go do liver surgery laparoscopically because you can't feel the tumor, you can't retract the liver, you can't stop bleeding when it happens. There will be air embolism, there will be tedious parenchymal transection, just endless, the things that I would be called into the office to explain to me why I should stop, okay? And looking back, I now have some of the same stubbornness and inertia that uh, some of my uh, seniors had, and therefore every day I need to tell myself, if one of my juniors comes in and says, I wanna try something, at least hear him out. At least go try it once before condemning it. And so again, it's hard to get old, and I am now getting old. <laughs> <laughs> then all these tools came about that made transection safer, easier. Now, in 2009, I, I, 
David Geller put together a very nice review of all the cases of laparoscopic resection that I, I were in the Western literature, over 2,500 cases, and very, very standard now being done in most places. And it's very clear, when we did our laparoscopic retreat to talk about where laparoscopic liver surgery fell back in 2008 in Louisville, we thought that solitary lesions less than five centimeters in segments two to six were perfect for laparoscopy. Left lateral section nectomies should be standard, but major liver resection should still be reserved for experienced surgeons, so expert surgery. So if you look at the figure on the bottom there, all those parts of the liver where you could reach it easily with a straight instrument were what was easy, okay, and makes sense. And all those parts of the liver that are high up in the liver needs you to come around the curve and much closer to the heart and the vena cava, much more dangerous and much more worrisome as a laparoscopic procedure. And that's why we saw it back then and we still see it now as the opportunity for a robotic surgery because we have better instruments robotically, okay? So two steps back to robotics in general. Robotics really came about in the nuclear age because folks that were isolating isotopes to make bombs, to make nuclear reactors, needed a way not to be holding the stuff that's radioactive. And therefore, it was all teller operators, okay? It sort of arms at length that uh, you operated outside the shield so you could actually pour and isolate things inside that are radioactive. So very much like laparoscopy. And that's how it started, and that was back in the 1930s and 40s. Then industrial robots really came, out about, came about in 1954 when somebody attached a computer to such a device. So this is really computerized teller operation wasn't a robot, didn't do anything automatic by itself. This was really remote operations translated by a computer. Then Kawasaki bought the patents, then the Unimation robot came about and suddenly there was automation and now there is no industry not touched by true robotics, okay, where things are being made without a human being actually involved except to make sure it is safe, okay. Most cars are made that way. And uh, so this is the evolution of robotics in industry. When you look at medical robots, we came the same way. Laparoscopy first, so really teleoperation. Now we're at the point of actually doing computer-aided surgical operations. This is not true robotics. There's nothing automated at all about what we do every day in front of the computer console. And should we be heading towards true robotics? How do we get public acceptance? How do we get wide multi-procedural adaptation? How do we get multiple vendors and uh, machines on the market so there's competition? There is innovation that is spurred by competition. All of this is where we're going and I think this society is poised to partner with many of those in industry trying to make the field better to go do this. This is the very first robotic liver operation ever done. That was in 2003. We did it at Sloan Kettering. Bill Jarnigan and I did it. And, uh, and did not publish it. You will notice this is a really easy hanging tumor off the left out lateral segment. Anyone can do this, and, and laparoscopically, you probably do this in 10 minutes, and you'd spend much less money. Smoke evacuation was not very good. The cutting instruments were not very good. I didn't think it was, uh, I got ready for prime time, and I certainly did not believe I should publicize it to make other people go into the field and endanger patients. And that, since I didn't think I could teach a thousand people to do this, I didn't think it was important and I did not publish and that's why Miloslav Riska at the bottom left picture in the center there published it from Serbia in 2006. I just thought, too early for routine adaptation, uh, adoption, not enough tools. Then. Tremendous work at the Intuitive Corporation, SI, XI, Robot, two consoles, and suddenly you can actually assist, you can actually teach in comfort, and you could take the operation back if uh, the resident or your fellow or your uh, co-attending wasn't quite doing it right. Many more instruments, and now suddenly I thought it was a real field. And that's why about six, seven years ago I came back to the field 
That's because now we can see better. We have improved tools, including better sealers and staplers. We can sew better. We can teach with less anxiety. And then, therefore, I return to the field to try to make it real and to try to be able to teach others to go do it. So take this, for example. Here's a patient, right lobe liver lesion. Didn't, this is a physician who didn't want anyone to know that she had cancer. So she had this tumor ablated and ablated, ablated over about a period of four or five years, never completely died, and it was up against the diaphragm, and now clearly was growing again, and she needed a right hepatic lobectomy. But taking her to the operating room to do a robotic case, it's very clear. Not only do you need to take out half her liver, you need now to take out the right diaphragm. Ultrasound, very essential, and that's because now you can actually see deep. I don't want haptics. I just want be, to be able to see what's deep and to be able to do it, okay? And uh, so here I am, I'm encircling the right hepatic portal pedicle, and, uh, and by pulling it to the left, uh, to the patient's left with an umbilical tape, I protect everything on the left liver. Since the tumor was nowhere near the junction of the left and right portal pedicles, you actually did not need to go isolate everything at the portal hepatis. Single staple load will take all of the blood vessels going to the right liver. You'll see the section here along the vena cava. You'll see the respiratory variation on the vena cava. There is the right hepatic vein. We're going to dissect it straight back to the uh, vena cava. We're going to take the liver in front of the vena cava. Then we're going to take the, vena ca uh, the uh, hepatic vein right off the vena cava. Then suddenly the right liver and the left liver no longer is attached. But notice the liver is still hung up on the diaphragm. That's because unlike open operations, I almost never cut the triangular ligament early. That's because gravity is a really good tractor and, and the triangular ligament and the tumor adherent is actually a really good counter uh, traction. And therefore, here we are entering into the right chest. CO2 goes up there, but that's absorbed very quickly, okay? And, uh, and therefore, suddenly, here is the entire right liver with a piece of diaphragm on it into a bag. We're gonna put it aside. Then we're gonna go sew up this hole, okay? And sewing is really, really straightforward. This is different than straight instruments way up high in the chest. And this is one of my fellow sewing, and she had not done met that many cases. And you'll see, she does an amazing job, even though I'm standing at bedside going, so, tie, tie, come on, tie, 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 please, okay? <laughs> but she really is doing a great job. <laughs> and, uh, and then we just suck out the CO2 as much as we can. The rest absorbs within the next 12 hours. I don't put in a chest tube. And the patient goes home in 36 hours. You can't do that as an open operation, okay? You just can't do that as an open operation. And so how do we go choose the cases that are right for this? That's gonna be key to the field because we have to prove value. So you'll see, we're gonna suck out the air and that will be that, okay? Because you don't have haptics, early on, that's been a good thing because most of us have come to realize it's unnecessary. Don't want it because it's too expensive. I want the tools to be as cheap as possible. That's because if everybody's arguing against robotics because of price, I want every chance that it's competitive in price to things that we do normally. But because of that, we need to see in other ways, okay? Is it near infrared so that we can uh, uh, see fluorescence? Uh, uh, do we go and look for our uh, tumor by antibodies? Do we go look at, with narrow band imaging for peritoneal carcinomatosis and the neovascularization about tumor? These are all things that are now making robotic surgery better and better. But the key thing really is that a lot of ways we can use to visualize, we have to prove value. Here is a case I did with ICG, Indesign and Green. Liver surgeons have used Indesign and Green forever, okay? We use it to assess liver function. That's because when you inject, inject Indesign and Green, liver takes it up, turns it bright green. Tumor doesn't take it up, so it stays black. Therefore, if you cut on liver and it stays green as you go, you have a negative margin. As soon as you see black, you've hit tumor and you should go a little further, okay? So here's a tumor way in the back of segment seven, and, and uh, we're coming through parenchyma, flashing for fluorescence the whole time, and I leave it hung on the, t on the diaphragm until the very end, and this operation we can do in about 30 minutes, and this patient 
goes home in the same afternoon, okay? This is a teeny tiny operation for a tumor in a terrible place that otherwise would have required a big incision and would be very hard to reach unless you're willing to come with a laparoscope through the chest. But now we could see not just in green and, and metabolism, but specifically for cancer. So I have a protocol currently running using copper 64 and a CEA antibody named M5A to go look for any tumor that is positive in CEA. And so if somebody has a regular FDG PET scan that's negative and we're looking for cancer because we know there's cancer, we inject copper 64 M5A. We not only can do a PET scan to go look for it, we, in the operating room we can actually have high energy gamma uh, counters like the one on the left or low energy beta counters the uh, laparoscopic of that on the right and go look for tumor in the operating room. So here's a patient, 36 year old, had a right colon resection, had liver resection, and now with the rising CEA and we cannot find the tumor, okay? So, and the PET scan did not show very much, so we did a CEA scan using Copper 64 m 58 there are the tumors, and we went ahead and did a retroperitoneal dissection of the nodes, didn't find anything anywhere else, and this is the patient three years after the retroperitoneal node dissection, five years after the liver resection, doing quite well with the normal CEA, okay? So how many of these antibodies are we gonna use? CEA can be used for breast, can be used for gastric, can be used for pancreatic. How many do we need? And what else should we label it up with? We're in the process of labeling it up with fluorescence, so we can actually find it in the operating room using fluorescence. And we will guide ourselves using a preoperative PET scan, but in the operating room, we will have handheld gamma counters and fluorescence to go look for these tumors. Robotics can also change hospital stay. That's been very, very clear, okay? But the key thing to think about there really is trying to find the right operations for robotics. So it is not uncommon that Surgeons will try to do the biggest operation they've ever done open robotically and hope that it goes well and hope that they can actually say that they did it, okay? The way I look at it, major liver resections, the recovery really is dominated by the physiology of re liver regeneration. It has nothing or very little to do with the incision. That's why I choose for my robotic operations, mostly those patients have small, poorly placed tumors, difficult to reach with straight laparoscopic instruments requires large incisions for open resection where the recovery is actually dominated by fascial or skin incision. If we choose the operations that way, we will be able to prove to our administrators, to the public, and to the third party payer that we are doing the right thing, okay? So here is a tumor deep inside segment seven here. We're gonna go do an isolated segment seven resection. Ultrasound shows us a lesion that's very deep. And we're gonna come right along the plane of the right hepatic vein. And now because the sealers are pretty good that I'm taking the segment seven pedicle right there. And our staplers can be driven from the, from the console and therefore, the crossing vein from the right hepatic vein could be taken with a stapler. And again, the liver is still hung on the triangular ligament. You can see the tenderness portion of the diaphragm up there, okay? And then, if we lift up the entire liver now I, I, and take the posterior capsule, this entire thing is done in less than 40 minutes and this patient could go home in less than 24 hours. This is outpatient liver surgery. And if we can do that, everyone understands it's real, it has value, and that we should go do this, okay? And then, in order to make it so that the patients can go home, that's because the extraction site, how we get, deal with that is really important. So most of the time when I extract, I go through the rectus, but I don't cut the rectus. I do the anterior rectus sheath, I do the posterior rectus sheath, I split the muscles and I take the tumor out, and then I close the sheets without sewing muscle because sewing muscle is what hurts. And that's why in this case, here we are taking out segment seven, eight, uh, six, seven. And because this patient had metastatic colorectal cancer in both ovaries and needed a bilateral oophorectomy and a hysterectomy, we're gonna go take out this piece pretty big piece of liver transvaginally, and the patient will wake up 
with eight millimeter incisions and very, very happy, okay? And, uh, and that's because natural orifice extraction makes sense. Natural orifice surgery is too hard. It is not about the size of the incision, the cosmetic results, about functional recovery so that patients could go back to their normal lives, okay? And uh, therefore, if it is right for the patient to have this, this is what we do. And then closing the vaginal cuff, very, very straightforward. Combining operations so that patients aren't put through two or three different operations for something we can eradicate in a single, okay? So I've written a series of papers with my fellows and my colleagues and my partners on combining colon and liver resection. Now with the XI robot, we can actually do it really easily without even moving the robot tower. We just turn the tower after the liver and work on the pelvis. And that's why these are the last hundred cases I've done. Half the people go home in the first 36 hours, so it's, so it's long stay outpatient surgery, okay? Since most hospitals in this country are contracting for four or five days in hospital for minor to deliver resections and seven to nine days for major, the administrators love this because suddenly we are proving value and we're putting real dollars back into the budget. And almost all my patients now go home with this device. It is a VivoFit, it is not a Fitbit. And the reason it's different is because the VivoFit from Garmin, and I have no stock in Garmin or any payments from Garmin, this device is waterproof. Patients can shower. This device has a one-year battery. So every one of you that's wearing an iWatch and every night, if you, you forget to charge it, the next day it runs out, go buy something that actually lasts, okay? And so suddenly the patients can have a device that monitors how they do, and this is the patient that had the lobectomy and the diaphragmatic resection. Back to 6,000 steps on day five. No doubt we did that patient a good operation. So how do we teach now? We now need atlases of surgery that doesn't just show what we do in the surgical field. We need positioning, we need instrument recommendations, we need port placement, we need orchestration, because everyone in the room now participates on this operation. We need workflow, not just for SI and XI, but all the robots that are now coming. We need, ev and evaluation down the line as to whether some, where somebody is on a, on a learning curve, I don't think it's gonna be number of cases. It's gonna be how you do when we go look at the data from the robot as to how efficient you were and how well you got the operation done, okay? So instrument exchanges, instrument usage, collisions, wasteful movements, those will be things we will have to count in order to determine the experience level of a surgeon and to credential them for advanced cases. That's why we need all these things, and that's why now the current generation of atlases for robotic surgery are starting to come along. So in the last edition of the atlas I do with Pierre Clavien, we put 18 chapters in robotics in it, and, and that uh, atlas has already been downloaded 26,000 times. And this year, this summer, we're gonna publish the Sages Atlas in Robotic Surgery. I have to push this a little bit. That's because it's been a wonderful collaboration with many members of this organization to do this, and all of the proceeds of this atlas, which includes workflow for 34 operations that we think are robotically feasible, will go back to Sages, back to education. So, we're really not in robotics. We're in telesurgery. So should we be going to robotics? Okay, so I show the picture down in the down, bottom left. That's the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I show that because from there, they drive the Mars rover. The Mars rover has a lag of 20 minutes. Whatever you send up to the Mars rover actually will not be acknowledged by the Mars rover for at least 20 minutes. Therefore, everything the Mars rover does is programmed and runs on its own with no-go zones, with automated tasks, that's what we need to be heading for. I also show that picture on the bottom left because that arrow there is my house. <laughs> that's why I go hang out with the scientists at the JPL and the, at Caltech. It is an amazing place, come visit us and, uh, and 
And again, I am absolutely convinced that true robotics will happen and will happen in the next five years, okay? It might be for tasks, suturing, tying, stapling. It could be for scenes, parenchymal transection or anastomosis, or it could be whole operations. And the first ones I would predict would be oophorectomy and cholecystectomy. And on the right there is the Uber truck that was de delivering beer. And uh, as you all know, last week there was an accident with a death, but the number of miles that, car, that driverless cars have already gone on our highways, there's no doubt, it is all here. And in surgery, we will need to accept it and we will need to partner to go do this. And the reason this is really important for our society, if we don't do it, the interventional radiologists will. And someday, I would still like surgeons to drive these, okay? Because we know what to do if, so, if someone's in trouble and we need to convert. We are the best people to sit at the consoles even when we're not operating. And if we don't go do it, IR will do it, interventional, whatever endoscopy will do it, or some administrator will sit there with automatic operations. And that would really be wrong, okay? And we need to partner to go get this done. And then, just to finish up, no doubt, MIS surgery is, uh, is uh, taking hold, and, uh, and, and particularly in robotics. So we looked at the National Cancer Database 2010 to 2014, lots of cases that were done. Over that period of time, four-fold increase in robotic resections in that period of time. Laparoscopy also went up, but at a much slower rate, 1.3 to 1.9 uh, times, uh, whereas number of open resections are decreasing. And very clear, okay, that inpatient stay, readmission, 30 day mortality, 90 day mortality, better in most things with an MIS approach. And that R0 resections, margins, median node retrieval are all favoring uh, MIS approach. And so, no doubt, MIS surgery is here to stay, and robotics is probably going to allow us easier entry for the next generation and for the current generation. So some people will say, awfully expensive, okay? And you're right, if you, you had a Lamborghini sitting in traffic, uh, it kind of is a waste, but it's still kind of nice, okay? What we need to do, <laughs> what we need to do is make that Lamborghini cost the same as that Toyota behind it, okay? <laughs> and that's where all the other companies are coming, okay? Many, many entries are coming and uh, very excited about it. I'm particularly excited, excited about some of the single port and single uh, access uh, technology that's coming along, even though the first run through laparoscopic resections of gall gallbladders didn't, uh, uh, didn't pan out to be the best thing. But I'm convinced that we're gonna go put some of these single site endoscopic robots through and do transgastric surgery, whether it's mapping an early gastric cancer or whether it's the GE junction to go do Barrett's from the bottom up, or whether it's transvaginal pelvic floor reinforcement without mesh, whether it's transoral surgery, nodal dissections in the groin or axilla, or fetal surgery, okay? This is all coming, and trying to figure out what the instrumentation we need are only way they, they, the instrument makers can know is for us to say it to them and make sure it happens. The catheter robots are coming. This, uh, this one just got FDA clearance. I have no stake in Oris, but it's really a neat robot. It is a re catheter robot that's driven from a console and holds position perfectly and is tied to a CT scan and can be navigated out to sixth and seventh order bronchi so that they can actually go and do a biopsy and possibly down the line do ablations or mark pieces of lung for laparoscopic and thoracoscopic surgery. But you could just imagine all the other things you could do with this, okay? Or catheter robots like this. I've been waiting for a catheter robot for me to drive around the ventricles of the brain so I could inject parts of the brain to try to cure Alzheimer's. I've been looking for one coming down the spine in order to go do spinal surgery. So many, many different ways that we can actually go do this. So that's why I'm gonna end here. Gene editing, that is something I do in my lab with a lot of uh, colleagues. This is a huge and emerging field, and it will intersect with surgeons and MIS surgeons in a huge way. 
So not only now can we improve structural protein production, such as trying to cure muscular dystrophy by doing gene therapy, we can do cellular or secreted protein production, such as hemophilia, thalassemia, mucopolysaccharidosis, cystic fibrosis. We could disable genes for viral replication, such as in hepatitis B. We can make host cells not infectable by HIV or other viruses by just engineering out the CCR5 receptor, and all of these are currently in human clinical trials. The big problem, and so just to show you progress, all of you have seen one or the other of the Bubble Boy movies, okay? That is severe combined immunodeficiency syndrome, that's ADA skid. It, uh, the kids are born with a deficiency in adenosine deaminase. Suddenly they can't fight infection. They have to live in a bubble. So depending on whether you're this generation, that's Jake Gyllenhaal, or last generation, that's John Travolta, this is what they were depicted as, but this is what they look like now, okay? These are two kids out of bubble for more than three years, okay, without opportunistic infection, and that's why now there's gene therapy that's approved for use in the United States against combined immunodeficiency. But the problem is this. Most of them are based on viral vectors. Viral vectors are enormously expensive to make, so the best of the best out there are AAVs, adeno-associated, and per dose for many diseases, it's estimated it's going to be charged about $1.5 million. That is not real-world medicine. And it's because it costs so much to make the stuff. Immune reaction allow, makes it so that it's impossible to give a second time. Okay, but both of these, as surgeons, we can help by delivering the th genes and the therapy closer to target by things that we do as MIS surgeons. We're probably going to cut the cost by tenfold, by hundredfold, simply by number of particles necessary. And if we can deliver it into the fetus in the first two trimesters, suddenly the human that is born is tolerant to the virus and you can actually give repeated doses, okay? So this is all coming, and it's gonna intersect with those of us who actually have a passion for this and have, this, have the technology to go deliver therapies to specific organs, okay? And that's why, will local delivery of virus at targets in vivo allow better gene editing? Will fetal delivery cure genetic diseases? Will fetal delivery allow repeated administrations? These are important questions, not only for the field of gene therapy, but for fetal and pediatric surgery, and important areas of study for fetal and pediatric robotic surgery. To end, progress, that's what we need. Innovation, that's what the society's always been about, okay? And innovation doesn't, it's not just new. It has to be better, and better to me is safer, easier, faster, cheaper. It has to be one of those, or a combination of those. We need to, innovate, disrupt, reduce the practice and teach, and also teach our young people to go do this. And that's because what we need for society is more cures, less invasive, and affordable by everyone. Thank you.